So good afternoon. Today we are going to talk about thyroid gland goiter. So we have previously previously discussed about the anatomy of thyroid. Now we'll discuss about the goiter. Goiter. What is goiter? So goiter just means the enlargement of thyroid gland. So it includes a vast spectrum of disease from simple swelling to neoplastic swelling to inflammatory swelling to infective swelling. So the, the simplified or rather the the extensive classification of goiter is seen in this slide. You can see the simple non-toxic goiter, then you have the toxic goiter, you have neoplastic goiter and inflammatory goiter. A simple non-toxic goiter is what we'll be discussing today in two parts. The first aspect will deal with diffuse hyperplastic goiter, colloid goiter and nodular goiter. And the second one we'll deal with is solitary nodule. And recurrent nodule is the fifth type. Now toxic goiter is also classified similarly into diffuse goiter, nodular goiter and solitary nodule and recurrent nodule. Now the next category is neoplastic goiter. This may include benign swellings like adenoma and malignant goiters like carcinoma in 95% cases and lymphoma in 5% cases. And that will be entirely discussed in a different uh, topic known as thyroid neoplasm in which we will be stressing on malignancy of thyroid gland. Now the last category is inflammatory goiter. This includes autoimmune thyroiditis such as chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Then you have the granulomatous thyroiditis of decurve veins thyroiditis, fibrosing or redal thyroiditis. You have infected thyroiditis seen in certain acute bacterial and viral infections, chronic infections like tuberculosis and syphilis, and certain other conditions which involves amyloid deposition. So these are the various uh, various uh, diseases that can result in a goiter. Now saying this, we'll be going into simple non-toxic goiter, in which case, in which we'll be discussing about diffuse cytoplastic colloid goiter and nodular goiter in this session. Now this is a pictorial, uh, pictorial showing the difference of the three types. So you have the healthy thyroid gland which is butterfly shaped with two lobes and the isthmus. Then you have the diffuse goiter which is showing enlargement of the entire gland. Then you have the nodular goiter which shows mild enlargement of the entire gland as well as nodules all over the surface. Now the regarding the course or the history or the pathology, pathogenesis of diffuse hyperplastic and colloid goiter. And before going further, I want to mention here that diffuse hyperplastic colloid goiter and nodular goiter are different phases of the same goiter. So if a goiter is left alone for several years, it will end up as a, it will go through all three types of the goiter. Now the first phase known as diffuse hyperplastic goiter, it is seen, it can be physiological, it is seen during puberty, or the early childhood or teenage, and can be seen during pregnancy. Then it is also seen in areas where goiter is endemic, which results in primary iodine deficiency resulting in the diffuse hyperplastic goiter. Similarly, secondary iodine deficiency can also occur due to the food intake, either excess dietary fluoride or intake of goitrogens. Goitrogens are substances that promote the formation of goiter. They include uh, vegetables like cabbage and broccoli, etc. And certain drugs like paramino salicylic acid, lithium, phenylbutazone, antithyroid drugs, radioactive iodine, all of them can result in secondary iodine deficiency. Another rare cause is the dishormonogenetic goiter, where there is a enzymatic deficiency due to the uh, genetic factors. Now, persistent increase in the thyroid stimulating hormone is said to be the reason for the diffuse activity of all the lobules of the thyroid gland. And this, if once it continues, it results in diffuse hyperplastic goiter. So the primary pathology is persistent increase in TSH level, which causes diffuse activity in all the lobules, which results in diffuse hyperplastic goiter. Now, when this may go on for a few months to a few years, and later on the TSH stimulation decreases. At that point, most of the follicles become inactive and get filled with colloid. And this results in colloid goiter. Now regarding nodular goiter, as mentioned earlier, it is one and the same thing, the same goiter 
if left alone and undiagnosed and unevaluated will result in nodular goiter over the years. So initially there is persistent TSL stimulation which causes the diffuse hyperplasia. Later on there is fluctuation in the TSL stimulation that means the level increases and decreases and this results in mixed areas of active lobules and inactive lobules. The active lobules become more vascular and hyperplastic and finally hemorrhage occurs which results in central necrosis leaving behind a ring of active follicles surrounding that central necrotic area. The necrotic lobules then join together to form nodules. The same process repeats at different sides of the gland and this results in multi-nodular coiter. The point to note here is that the center of the nodule is inactive while the internodular tissue is the one which has activity. And another point which I would like to highlight here is that Hyperplastic goiter is technically reversible while the nodular goiter is irreversible. So, if at all an early diagnosis is made during the young age, it can be reversed with the right treatment. So, on the left, you have the diffuse hyperplastic or colloid goiter. On the right, you have a huge multinodular goiter. Now, the a few words on the clinical features. So, first thing here is the age of presentation, then the palpatory findings and the classical features which I have not mentioned in this slide. So now the age. So diffuse hyperplastic goiter or colloid goiter can be seen during childhood or in and around puberty or in and around pregnancy. Now nodular goiter is generally seen in the middle age and usually affects females and is generally considered to be a slowly progressive disease. That means it develops over 5 to 15 years to attain a huge size. Now on palpation, the colloid goiter is generally soft and has a diffuse enlargement of the gland. But nodular goiter has also a, a diffuse enlargement of the gland, but there will be multiple nodules palpable. That means it has a nodular surface. Actually, individually, each nodule has a smooth surface. And the consistency is generally firm. Now, the patients may give history of recent pain or recent sudden increase in size. This usually suggests that a hemorrhage has occurred into the nodule or one of the nodules has undergone malignant transformation. Now, these are the differentiating features. Now, besides this, it will have the classical features that are attributed to uh, thyroid swelling. That is, the movement on deglutition, the thyroid swelling will move on deglutition or swelling, and it will not move on protrusion of tongue, which differentiates it from a thyroglossal cyst. Similarly, horizontally, it has no independent mobility. It moves along with the trachea alone, and vertically, you can either say it has restricted mobility or it has no mobility. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the complications. Now, along with this, anytime in a long standing nodular goiter, the patient may develop features of thyrotoxicosis, such as insomnia, restlessness, anxiety, tremor, hot, moist palms, heat intolerance, palpitation, tachycardia, like that. So the complications include either a long-standing MNG developing thyrotoxicosis, that is known as secondary thyrotoxicosis, or developing malignancy, that is known as follicular carcinoma usually, or can have a hemorrhage, or can have pressure symptoms, especially tracheal obstruction or compression. Then in very long-standing ones, you can actually develop calcification. <coughs> now, a few words regarding the investigation. So the investigation is the same for any neck swelling or thyroid swelling. You have three elements, that is the blood test, imaging, and the histopathology. Now blood tests for a, for a thyroid swelling includes the thyroid function test, that is to assess the T3, T4, and TSH levels. I already mentioned earlier that the biological active form is the free form, so you have to do the free T3 and free T4 as well. Then a serum calcium can be done to look for any alterations, especially if uh, a malignancy or medullary cast of thyroid or parathyroid swelling is suspected. Now, ultrasound neck is the imaging of choice. It will help you to assess the gland, the nodal status, the relation of the gland to the uh, vital structures in the neck, whether retrocellular extension or not. Similarly, then regarding the nodes, whether benign or malignant, all of this can be made out through an ultrasound neck. Now, if you want us to go a step further, you can go ahead with CT neck. CT neck will show the true relations uh, to the vital structures as well as the retrosternal extension. 
Now, the third element is sister pathology, and FNAC is an investigational choice. It will help to diagnose the, all types of the goiter, that is, uh, whether it is hyperplastic, colloid, or MNC. And it's very useful to differentiate uh, most of the diagnosis in, in the thyroid gland, ex ex except the follicular carcinoma thyroid and follicular adenoma, as it is unable to differentiate the two. But right now, we are discussing about goiter, uh, MNG and colloid goiter and hyperplastic goiter, in which case FNAC is the ideal investigation of choice. Now, if, the, if the swelling is small, then an ultrasound and FNAC also can be done. Now, besides this, you can go for the preoperative investigations like X ray neck to assess the trachea or whether any compression or deviation or anything is there, indirect laryngoscopy to assess the vocal cords, and the routine blood test for preoperative evaluation. Now the treatment, in the case of hyperplastic goiter, I told you it is, it is reversible. So uh, correct early diagnosis and treatment with oral thyroxine around uh, 0.15 to 0.2 milligram can be given daily and the swelling may regress completely. Now if it's in the nodular state that you would to identify the disease, then the condition is irreversible. And then surgery is indicated. It can be kept for a few years, but surgery is indicated when either for cosmetic reasons or if there are pressure symptoms to the large size or there has malignant transformation. So those are three indications for total thyroidectomy in a MNC. And the treatment is total thyroidectomy with lifelong replacement of oral thyroxine. Now earlier we used to do subtotal and near total thy thyroidectomy wherein a thumbprint of tissue is left behind either on one side or both sides. Now the problem here is that that thumbprint of tissue may enlarge to form a huge thyroid and that point reoperation for the recurrent nodular goiter is very difficult and the chances of nerve injury are very high. Hence, today we follow total thyroidomy with lifelong replacement of thyroxine. Thank you. That is the topic for now. Now we'll come again in the next topic that is discrete thyroid nodule.